Coming up on Arirang News, South Korea's vaccine campaign is catching up. First doses have now been given to more than a quarter of the population, most of that done in just the past few weeks. The countries of NATO get tough on China, Russia and North Korea, calling China a systemic challenge and urging North Korea to return to dialogue and give up its nuclear weapons. And the South Korean government meets with the country's parcel delivery workers who are on strike to look for a solution to what the workers say are broken promises by their employers, unfair pay and overwork. It's 5 o'clock p.m. here in Seoul. Thank you for joining us on Arirang News. I'm Devin Whiting. The members of NATO are at their summit are taking a tougher stance on uh, on China, North Korea and Russia, encouraged in that direction by the Biden administration. NATO is calling on North Korea to engage in dialogue for the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Also, for the first time, the alliance has recognized China as a country that poses systemic challenges. Kim Dami has the details. The U.S. and the 29 other NATO member states are urging North Korea to resume what they call meaningful dialogue with the U.S. to achieve a complete, verifiable and irreversible denuclearization. In a joint communique issued after the summit Monday in Brussels, the leaders are called on the regime to fully implement its international obligations, including the elimination of its missiles and nuclear arsenal. Also, for the first time, NATO has moved explicitly to counter the ambitions of China, stipulating in its communique that Beijing poses systemic challenges. NATO leaders called on China to uphold its international commitments and to act responsibly in the international system, including in space, cyber and maritime domains, in keeping with its role as a major power. At the last NATO summit in 2019, the alliance kept a low profile and took a more neutral stance, calling China's expanding influence an opportunity, and North Korea wasn't even mentioned. NATO's tough stance on China and North Korea analysts say comes from the return of the U.S. as a more cooperative leader. This time because of the rise of China uh, and also because Biden government is perceiving the rise of China very urgently, um, I think the targets of NATO is becoming more and more a China rather than Russia. Visiting NATO headquarters on Monday, Biden reassured America's and European allies that the U.S. stands by their side, a distinct shift in tone from Trump, who had threatened to withdraw from NATO and accused the allies of contributing too little to their own defense. Russia was also singled out. NATO pointed out that Russia continues to breach the values, principles, trust and commitments of international agreements. NATO leaders also echoed the need for Iran to cease all ballistic missile activities, endorsing the revival of the 2015 Iran nuclear deal. Kim Dami, Arirang News. The U.S. reportedly has no immediate plans to directly provide COVID-19 vaccines to North Korea, but supports international aid efforts for the North. This is according to Seoul-based Yonhap News Agency, citing a State Department official. On Monday, President Moon Jae-in, during a press conference in Austria, said Seoul will give the North vaccines if the regime agrees. He added that the U.S. would likely welcome such a move. North Korea still claims to have no new confirmed cases of COVID-19. And President Moon is in Austria for a state visit. Monday evening, he attended a state banquet held in the Belvedere Palace, hosted by Austrian President Alexander van der Bellen. The Belvedere Palace is well known for its beautiful views and the artwork on display by the famous Austrian uh, painters Gustav Klimt and Egon Schiele. The banquet was attended by 56 people, including Austria's former President Heinz Fischer and its current Vice Chancellor Werner Kogler. The menu included a traditional Austrian dish of sea bass and asparagus. For the evening's entertainment, an orchestra of Korean and Austrian musicians performed the Korean Simple Suite No. 1, composed by Kim Han-gi, and music by Austrian composers Mozart and Haydn. President Moon also met on Monday with the mayor of Vienna, where he expressed hope for more cooperation on a variety of fronts. He later met with the Speaker of the Austrian Parliament's lower house to discuss ways to promote their strategic partnership at the parliamentary level. Lee reports. 
President Moon Jae-in has expressed hope that Vienna, known for its creative and sustainable urban development, will cooperate with South Korea's local governments in various smart city initiatives. President Moon met on Monday with Vienna Mayor Michael Ludwig as part of a state visit to Austria. He said Vienna is a model case he wants to know more about. President Moon also asked the city to pay special attention to ethnic South Koreans in Austria, with roughly 80 percent of the 2,700 South Koreans in Austria calling Vienna home. Lu Wick thanked President Moon for visiting and praised him for his efforts for peace and human rights. I think it's very important for cooperation on the economic and political front, especially in terms of international relations. I'd like to express Austria's support for peace and labor market issues, like the minimum wage. Later Monday, President Moon met Wolfgang Sabaka, the Speaker of the Austrian Parliament's lower house, to discuss measures to develop bilateral ties, especially at the parliamentary level. He was accompanied by two South Korean lawmakers who joined him as special delegates. President Moon called on Austria to beat the pandemic based on the two sides' mutual trust and to prepare for the post-COVID era as strategic partners. Young Eun, Arirang News. The K-pop boy band BTS are holding on to their number one spot on Billboard's main chart for a third straight week with their latest single, Butter. It makes the song the group's longest chart topper yet. Lee Sung Jae reports. BTS's single, Butter, is without doubt the hottest song in the U.S. right now, with the song topping the Billboard Hot 100 chart for the third week in a row. It means the group has now surpassed its previous record set with Dynamite, which debuted at number one upon release and stayed there for two weeks. While Dynamite later reclaimed its place at the top of the chart after spending two weeks at number two, Butter is the group's first to stay at number one for three straight weeks. According to Billboard on Monday, Butter held on to the number one spot with 15.4 million U.S. streams and 138,400 downloads in the week ending June 10th. It also attracted over 24.6 million radio airplay audience impressions, up 10 percent from the previous week. The song has been a mega hit, not just in the U.S., but globally as well. The single topped iTunes' top songs chart in more than 100 regions, as well as in South Korea and Japan just a day after its release. The song also debuted at number three on Britain's official charts, Time with Dynamite. Butter has also shattered records Dynamite held previously on other platforms, such as YouTube and Spotify. The latest single garnered 20.9 million streams on its first day of release, becoming the most listened to song in a single day in Spotify's history. It also racked up 108.2 million views on YouTube in its first 24 hours, beating Dynamite and its previous record of 101.1 million views. Released on May 21st, BTS hoped a vibrant summer number would give off good energy during the pandemic. But can BTS make it four weeks straight? We'll find out next week. Lee Seung Jae, Arirang News. Talks began this afternoon at South Korea's National Assembly about how to address the conflict between the country's parcel delivery workers who are on strike and the companies they say are overworking them. Attending the talks are representatives of the labor union and the government. As the talks began, around 5,000 union members held a rally near the assembly, accusing their employers of breaking the promise that they made in January. The companies had agreed to hire more employees to sort parcels and to stop late-night deliveries. The government hopes to have a proposal by Wednesday that will make the companies keep that pledge. Reports say last year 16 delivery workers died from causes related to overworking. 
South Korea's ruling Democratic Party says it's going to pass a bill in Parliament this month that will allow workers to take an extra day off if a public holiday falls on a weekend. There's already a system like that in place, but it applies only to the Lunar New Year, the Korean Thanksgiving holiday Chuseok, and Children's Day. Under this bill, it would apply to all so-called red days, and if the law passes, that'll mean four extra days off this year. That's because four of the holidays that remain this year, including Liberation Day and Christmas, fall on weekends. The leader of the Democratic Party said this is a win-win because it'll give people more time to rest and also boost consumer spending. Hyundai Motor is accelerating its efforts to develop flying cars. The CEO of Hyundai North America says they may be operational at major U.S. airports by 2025. Another South Korean company says an air taxi service could be launched in Seoul five years after that. Paeonji has more. South Korean auto giant Hyundai Motor has said it could have an air taxi service in operation as early as 2025. The CEO of Hyundai North America, Jose Munoz, made the comments in an interview broadcast at the Reuters event's Car of the Future conference. He had previously said urban air taxis would be flying at major U.S. airports by 2028. But he said on Monday U.S. local time that Hyundai's plans for air mobility vehicles are ahead of schedule. The CEO said he sees this market as a significant growth opportunity, adding that he is, quote, very confident of the technology's development. He also said Hyundai expects its flying cars to serve not only residential customers, but also to transport cargo, and that the company will also offer services around those vehicles, rather than simply selling them. Hyundai is currently developing air taxis powered by electric batteries that can carry five or six people from highly congested urban centers to airports. In 2019, the automaker had pledged to invest about 1.5 billion U.S. dollars into urban air mobility by 2025. As more companies focus on developing urban air mobility vehicles, another South Korean company, Hanwha Systems, also said it is currently working on air taxis that will be flying around Seoul. We plan to finish developing it by 2024 and test a service in 2025. We expect the service to go public starting 2030. The company added the vehicle, which will be able to carry up to five people, will not only become a new form of public transport, but it can also be used for military purposes and cargo delivery. Peunji, Arirang News. Time now for an in-depth look at the markets this afternoon. And for that, I'm joined on the line by Mr. Daniel Yu, Global Strategist at Uanta Securities. Mr. Yu, good afternoon. Thanks for making time today. Good afternoon. Well, it's the day before uh, this month's meeting of the Fed's Open Markets Committee. Reports say uh, that the Fed Chair Jerome Powell is likely to hold to his prediction of rates staying super low until 2023. But there's also a lot of anxiety out there with inflation as high as it is. Uh, what do you see happening this week at the Fed? Yes, uh, a lot of people are quite concerned about these inflationary numbers. If you look at the inflation number for last month, it was coming in as high as 5% year on year. Uh, and therefore, people are concerned. However, uh, we think that it is too early for uh, FOMC meeting to begin the taper clock in, uh, in, our, in our expectations. Um, if you look at Chairman Perel, uh, it is expected to probably deliver somewhat of a hint of tapering sometime probably towards the second half of this year rather than right now. Uh, and uh, most likely that the first hint might come in at August or September. Uh, if you look at the um, recent data on economic projection, um, it seems that the PC inflation numbers are somewhat revising up a bit. And also that plot might get a little bit closer for rate hike 
before the end of 2023, but nevertheless, uh, it's not going to be anytime soon. Um, we need to look at what's happening to the inflationary numbers, particularly related to the unemployment ratios. Uh, a lot of the labor-related uh, data is showing that there's a, some labor shortage, but it is very temporary. Uh, if you look at the, um, the new job created, it uh, seems to be very strong, but nevertheless, the unemployment ratio is still uh, quite high at 5.8% uh, level. Uh, if you look at the before the COVID-19 era, uh, if you look at the unemployment ratio, it was as low as 3.5%, uh, and um, the unemployment benefit-related numbers are much, much lower than what it is right now. Uh, what Fed is keep saying is that labor market is not stable uh, or uh, healthy yet. yet. Uh, and so far, since the COVID-19, more than um, 7 million jobs have been lost. It is recovering, but at a slow pace. So, yes, right now, there are more concern about the inflationary pressure, but uh, we don't think that this is something that's going to last for a long period. Uh, and therefore, the, this time around of FMC meeting, we are not going to hear uh, much particularly related to the tapering or the interest rate hike. Of course, investors are watching that. And on Wall Street, the S&P 500 closed at another all-time high on Monday, up almost two-tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq did even better with a gain of three-quarters of a percent. Uh, the Dow is off slightly. With all the uncertainty out there, uh, what's happening in the global markets? Uh, yes, uh, even though people are concerned about the inflation pressure, uh, if you look at the 10-year U.S. government bond rate, it tells us otherwise. The rate remains to be very stable, well below 1.5%. If you remember uh, several months ago, it was as high as 1.77%, rising sharply from the 0.5% territory to as high as that. Uh, but now it's down to below 1.5%, indicating that uh, the recent inflation pressure might be a short-term lift. Uh, that uh, starting next month, number will start to dwindle down. Uh, with this, if you look at the overall market, it did very strongly well, particularly related to the growth stock. Uh, NASDAQ was up 0.74% uh, to break uh, 14,000 territories. Uh, and as far as the NASDAQ 100 index, it did hit the record high numbers. Uh, and also, if you look at an S&P numbers, it was up to uh, 4,255, rising by about 0.2% territories. However, we did see continued some correction of Dow Jones, which was the one of the best index performance perform index that we've seen in the previous month. Uh, but this month, with these kind of pressure in terms of the economic data is that the price pressure might not be a long-term lived, uh, we are seeing some correction in the Dow Jones as it did very well last month. Uh, going into the future, as the economy recovers, uh, we think that the earnings of the corporation will continue to do well. And if that's the case, then the markets are likely to show even further rise. Uh, in terms of how much it will rise, it all depends on what kind of earnings we are going to get. Uh, so far, the second quarter earnings are going to be very, very good uh, if we start to come out. Um, as of uh, last week, we did see the first quarter results all come out, and that was coming in at much better than expected uh, in all areas. And here in Korea, uh, the market's today a little more subdued, a small gain on the Kospi for a fourth session in a row, and the Kosdaq unchanged. Tell us about the local market. Right. If you look at the Kospi, uh, it was slightly up by 0.2%. Ended at 3,258.63. Uh, still a little bit off from the uh, the peak of January, uh, which was 3,266. Uh, but if you look at the chart uh, uh, trend, uh, it might be breaking soon of the uh, triangular. Uh, box range. Uh, if it does, then uh, we think that the Korean market will do a uh, very strong rally, probably going into the summer. 
if you look at the overall market, um, the net investor uh, purchase, net purchases were coming from the individuals rather than foreign investors or institutional. Uh, but the amount itself is very limited. Uh, if you look at individual investors, they bought uh, 198.9 billion won worth of it. Uh, whereas the foreign investors and institutional investors have sold 157 billion and 42.9 billion, so uh, we didn't really see much of the movement yet. And I think the main reason for that is because Korea is much more keen about the FOMC meeting. Uh, if there's any kind of tapering uh, announcement uh, through this meeting then you might see a massive correction for Cosby because if we did see that happen in 2013 May. Uh, and U.S. market corrected only 6 7%, but uh, Cosby and Korea market corrected more than 15%. So uh, I think that people are just uh, watching over what's going to happen to the FMC meeting. However, once that is over, we think that FMC meeting is, as I said, it's not going to be any significant. And I don't think that there will be any announcement of tapering. If that happens, then we think the cost we will start to hit the record high number, uh, well above 3,266 that we saw in January. Uh, also, if you look at the uh, cost deck, uh, it is still haven't broken above 1,000 level yet, but most likely it will as the cost be uh, do well. Uh, all in all, if you look at the earnings growth rate, it is one of the most strongest earnings growth that we see in Korea for this year. And as the global economy recovery happens, then Korea being very sensitive to the economy recovery, uh, we think that Kospi has a very ample room for further rise in the future. All right, Mr. Yu, we'll have to leave it there for today and uh, find out what happens and uh, talk again about the Fed meeting uh, later this week. Appreciate uh, your insights uh, as always. Thank you. Thank you very much. South Korea has now administered at least one dose of a coronavirus vaccine to more than 13 million people, which is a quarter of the country's whole population. The campaign started out slow, but it's caught up impressively in just the last few weeks. Kim Yun-sung reports. Slow out of the blocks, but now sprinting ahead. South Korea was late to start in the race for COVID-19 vaccines, with the country two months behind the U.S. and many other European nations at the start of rollouts. Even in Asia, South Korea lagged behind countries like Japan and India. But now, South Korea is outpacing much of the world in vaccination rates. South Korean health authorities reported that by Tuesday afternoon, more than 13 million people had received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccines. Today, as of 2.30 p.m., the number of people who have received the first round of vaccinations has surpassed 30 million. So one out of four people have gotten at least one dose. On the back of Tuesday's inoculations, South Korea surpassed the 25 percent mark two weeks earlier than planned. And with 650,000 additional doses of the Pfizer vaccine due to arrive in the country on Wednesday, Health authorities say that the vaccination rates won't be hampered by a shortage of doses. The country kicked off its vaccine rollout on February 26th at a slow and steady pace, with a country taking three months to reach its first 4 million vaccinations, less than 8 percent of the country's population. But inoculations seriously began to pick up pace on May 27th, when the country started inoculations for ages 65 to 74. To ramp up vaccinations, the country entrusted more than 12,000 medical institutions to temporarily administer COVID-19 vaccines. Also, to efficiently distribute the leftover vaccines, the South Korean government started receiving online reservations from outside the age group by using popular online platforms like Kakao and Naver. Within 15 days, country's vaccination rate hit 20 percent. As of June 15th, the country still falls below many European and North American countries in terms of the percentage of the population vaccinated, with more than half of Canada, the U.S. and the U.K.'s population having received at least one jab. But at the rate it's going, 
South Korean health authorities expect to arrive at herd immunity earlier than their original plan of the end of November. Kim Hyun-sung, Arirang News. And the number of new cases of COVID-19 reported today in South Korea was below 400 for a second day in a row. Today, at 374 new cases, it was the lowest number in 84 days. There were four more deaths, raising the death toll to 1,992. As for the distancing rules, they'll stay in place as they are until July 4th, and then they're expected to be eased. Meanwhile, the country's uh, vaccination campaign, as Yunsung mentioned, is in full swing, nearly 25 percent, over 25 percent of the population now having received at least one dose. And that brings us to the end of this newscast. Uh, thank you for watching. More live news coming your way at 7 p.m. Korea time. Thank <laughs> you.